What's up guys, Miles here with 9to5Mac, and if you're a fan of good ideas, consider subscribing to the channel for future content like this. I'm sorry this took so long to drop, but I wanted to finally give my thoughts on the base model 24 inch iMac. This is an incredibly special machine in a lot of ways. It represents the first redesign for an iMac in a long time, and it's the first Apple all-in-one to run on their custom silicon. A lot of people are comparing this new iMac to other current Macs in the lineup and iMacs of the past, but I think it's good to remember that Apple's original intention with this machine is to compete with other all-in-one desktops. So I think reviewing the iMac through that lens is the most reasonable way to do so. So let's dive in. But first, a word from our sponsor. 9to5Mac on YouTube is sponsored by Intego. Macs are known to be less susceptible to viruses than Windows devices, but the popularity of the Mac platform means that nefarious parties are targeting macOS devices more than ever before. This is where Intego's Virus Barrier software comes into play. Virus Barrier X9 will protect your M1 or Intel-based Mac from malware like Silver Sparrow and Xcode Spy. Virus Barrier actively protects your Mac from malware and phishing attempts with real-time scans and automatic updates. You don't have to be any sort of computer expert to start using this software either, as the setup and configuration process is designed to be easy for all users. 9to5Mac readers can get up to two years of Intego Virus Barrier X9 protection for 50% off for a limited time when purchasing Intego's Mac Premium Bundle X9. This bundle includes all the great Virus Barrier features, plus more features for cleaning up your Mac and backing up your data. Be sure to click the first link in the description below if you're interested. And a big thanks to Intego for sponsoring 9to5Mac on YouTube. This machine has been out for a little while now, so I'm sure you've already got a pretty good idea of how much you like the design or not. And if you do like the design, I think that's great and definitely intentional by Apple. And I'm not even including the color aspect of the design yet. I'm just talking about it structurally speaking. It's obviously a crazy thin computer in comparison to the 21 inch iMac. And I think they did a great job of taking the design language of the iMacs of the past and translating that into a more modern interpretation. The hinge for tilting the display is smooth, the power buttons nice and tactile, and I think they laid out all the I.O. nicely for the most part. A lot of people also made the argument that they should have made the chassis thicker in order to eliminate this large chin, and that's obviously something Apple could have done, but I can understand that Apple may be viewing the chin as a part of the iMac from a branding perspective, and at least the chin is being used functionally here. Essentially, the entire computer plus the speaker lives inside of this chin. I just hope that the chin in the larger and more expensive iMac, hopefully coming later this year, is at least noticeably smaller than what we've got here. But in general, the chin honestly doesn't bother me. I'm so used to how the previous iMacs looked anyway. The color scheme for this computer is what has got most people on the fence about picking one of these up, as Apple hasn't had a light-colored bezel Mac since the 2017 MacBook Air, I believe. But even though I wasn't exactly down with this either upon seeing it in the render form, I gotta say it makes a lot more sense when looking at it in person. Also, when it comes to modern all-in-one computers, it's not hard at all to find one with with some sort of light colored bezel situation going on. It may be a light gray or a silver, but companies like HP and Dell, Acer, are still consistently releasing all-in-one computers with light colored bezels. So the iMac making this move really isn't something to be enraged over. And if you don't believe me, go on bestbuy.com right now and browse the all-in-one PC category. I guarantee you that the first page will have at least one or two all-in-one desktops with a light colored bezel that isn't the iMac. As far as the actual color options for this computer, they're obviously very much inspired by the iMac G3, which came with a bunch of snazzy color options. So this iMac is paying homage to the Apple we knew in the late 90s. There are seven different color options, which is still kind of crazy to see with a modern day iMac. But something to note is that us base spec plebs only get access to four of the seven different color options, which definitely bums me out a bit. But I think if you're really into the different color options, it's a really easy way for Apple to get you to spend that extra couple hundred bucks on the mid-tier option. I'm personally indifferent to all these color options, but I got pink because I figured it would pop a little bit on video, and it does. Pink is far from what I'd prefer my personal computer to look like, but when showing this computer off to other people, it instantly clicked why Apple did this and how this new iMac will be more impactful than the 21 inch model could have ever been. Out of everyone I showed this computer to, and not specifically my pink model, but the new iMac in general, I would always get the strongest reaction from women. All of these color matched accessories and the soft color scheme really appealed to 
to women I showed computer to. And I think it's fair to say that women are generally speaking more particular and conscious of aesthetics than guys are. And so having the sleek design plus the pop in colors instantly makes this computer more memorable and attractive to a customer base who otherwise doesn't particularly care about the way desktops look. As opposed to the previous iMac that people would see in the store and just recognize it as a computer, people are now going to see these big colored slabs in the store window and instantly get curious. And they'll begin to imagine how one of these color options could match an aesthetic setup they've already created. Apple also fully committed to the color options on these computers and you gotta respect it. The power cable, mouse, keyboard, lightning cable, and optional trackpad all have a matching color to the machine. Like Apple did not have to color the inside of the power connector, but they did. And these are all things that make the iMac stand out as an all-in-one option. All of this is to say that some people think that the color scheme was a misstep, but trust me, Apple definitely knows what they're doing and through owning this machine and getting people's opinions on it, I've truly gotten a grasp of Apple's intentions with this machine. Apple wants average consumers to start thinking about all-in-one computers again. And one of the ways you achieve that is by releasing a bold and colorful iMac. I wanna shift my focus back to the new power cable and peripherals. The 24 inch iMac is now using a bespoke power cable and it doesn't really have any unique functionality, but it's built extremely well and I love the industrial design. But when looking at how big the power supply on this thing is, it makes me wonder how much extra power the display and speakers make this computer draw because the computer essentially has an iPhone sized logic board inside, the same logic board found in my 11 inch iPad Pro. So I don't know, I just, I just thought that was interesting. Another thing to note is that us base model plebs also don't get the gigabit ethernet enabled power supply. And while I see no reason why all models couldn't have gotten that feature, I also don't really have a need for gigabit ethernet over AX Wi-Fi, which this iMac now has. With a strong connection, AX Wi-Fi is plenty sufficient for the vast majority of people who aren't constantly uploading and downloading large files on a time crunch. So while I'm not personally missing that port, I feel like it would just be so much simpler for both Apple and the consumer if all trims of the iMac had that ethernet power supply. Cause keep in mind, this is just a gigabit ethernet port, not a 10 gig ethernet port or anything crazy like that. So it would cost Apple nothing to throw this on all of the models. The new trackpad, keyboard and mouse are cool. Like I mentioned earlier, all these accessories are color matched with the iMac, which definitely gives the setup a vibe that none of the previous iMacs really offered. But that's pretty much it as far as changes to the accessories themselves. All the accessories feel exactly the same as the ones found on the previous iMacs. The only new addition to these accessories from a functionality standpoint is something that us pleb base bottle users also don't get access to, and that's the Touch ID button on the Magic Keyboard. I personally feel like Apple should have made this feature universal with the iMac, and Apple is probably overcomplicating things for themselves by having these two different manufacturing processes for these small little differences like a Touch ID button on the keyboard or the ethernet enabled power power supply, but hey, I'm probably just jealous or something. The IO on this machine has definitely been a talking point for the iMac, as you've either got two Thunderbolt ports and two USB 3 ports, or just two Thunderbolt ports on the base model. And initially I thought this was a terrible move by Apple, but I have to say when it comes down to using this machine every day, it hasn't really been a problem for me. I definitely think that a computer this expensive should have more ports than this, but I don't think the base model's port selection is actually that much worse than the higher spec model. And here's why. The 24 inch iMac on either version you buy will have two Thunderbolt ports. And these two ports have their own Thunderbolt controllers, meaning they'll individually support up to 40 gigabit per second throughput speeds. The two USB-C ports on the higher end iMac are USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports that will individually support up to 10 gigabits per second throughput speeds. So what I'm saying is that with just a Thunderbolt dock of some kind, you can instantly make up for those two USB 3 ports. At least that's the way I see it. And yes, not everyone is going to have a Thunderbolt Thunderbolt dock lying around ready for use, but acquiring one shouldn't be a problem for anyone buying a computer this expensive. And given that this computer only has type C ports, you're more than likely gonna get some sort of dock for this thing anyway. But for the people who aren't constantly plugging devices into their computer, then this IO situation likely won't be an issue at all. You can't really judge the IO on the iMac the same as a standard desktop because you don't need an HDMI or display port to plug your monitor into. It has a display built in. You don't need a port for a webcam a microphone, you've got that built in. And you don't need USB ports for a keyboard and mouse because it comes with that too. Unless you just don't like Apple's keyboard and mouse, you simply don't need the same kind of ports on a machine that has those things built in or included with the product. And with all the awesome wireless capabilities we've got with the iPhone and Macs 
software, there's increasingly less and less of a need for normies to have to have a whole slew of ports on the back of their machine. There are likely people with all-in-ones who've only seen the back of it once or twice throughout the entire ownership period. And don't forget, because of how thin it is, you can't exactly have every port on this machine. That's why the headphone jack is on the side, because the computer is too thin, but they obviously can't exclude a headphone jack. The IMAX Golden feature has always been that display, and that remains to be the case here with the 24-inch model. You're now getting a 4.5K Retina display, and that's really where all the money's going when you buy an iMac. The display is the one thing about the iMac that has always trumped all other all-in-one options. This is one of the highest resolution 24-inch displays that a consumer can get their hands on, period. With that high resolution, there are next to no pixels to be seen by the human eye. Everything about this display, from the clarity, to the brightness, the color reproduction, this is just such an excellent display to look at and use every day. And while they could have really made this display undefeated by giving an HDR capability or a mini LED panel, that's probably asking for too much from what's supposed to be known as the lower end iMac. This iMac is far from having the best display on an Apple product, but when comparing this display to all other all-in-ones, especially 24 inch all-in-ones, there's absolutely no comparison. The iMac wins every single time. The display on this iMac is also now 24 inches compared to 21 and a half inches, which is a noticeable screen bump. And if you've used a 21 inch iMac enough times, you'll be able to tell the difference in size with this model, but it's not really significant at all. And you can expect this iMac to fit in all the same places that the 21 and a half inch model could. Overall, the display experience doesn't really feel different from the 21 inch 4K iMac, but it's still such a good experience overall. Not that Apple really has the wiggle room to put out a subpar iMac display. The webcam in the new iMac has been updated to match the 2025K iMac's webcam. And if you aren't aware of how good that one is, here's a comparison I always like to do. I've got this webcam called the Logitech Brio, and it's one of the only 4K webcams out there and easily one of the most expensive you can buy. And the iMac's webcam more or less trumps the Brio in every regard, dynamic range, sharpness, clarity, all of it. And all of this goes to show how software tuning for cameras can make all the difference because I'm sure the sensors in both webcams aren't far off from one another. Apple just has much better image processing software in these iMac cameras. And because of how solid this webcam is and the fact that this device is running on M1, I'm quite surprised at the fact that they didn't throw center stage functionality on this webcam. If you're unaware, center stage is a new feature that they implemented on the new iPad Pros, and it's a feature that allows the camera to actively track your face, and the frame will crop and expand as you move around the frame. And this is done completely through software. The iPad Pro just has a really wide angle lens that allows for it. I thought center stage would be even more useful on the iMac than on the iPad Pro, because unlike a tablet, you're not gonna be moving your desktop computer around. And so I thought having that functionality on a more stationary product would be a bit more appreciated by customers, I think. But this also could be a feature that they save for the redesigned larger iMac that should be coming later this year. They've also updated the microphone in the new iMac. And I thought I'd record this segment entirely on the iMac's microphone so that you have a good idea of how good it sounds. Apple says that these microphones are studio quality, and I'm not really sure what Apple means when it says studio quality, because if you actually tried to record a song or a podcast with this built-in microphone, I think people would more than likely notice that you're not using pro equipment. But that isn't to dog the microphone setup in this iMac at all, because for a built-in microphone, it does sound crisp, it sounds clear, and I don't think you should be getting any quality complaints from anyone on the other end of a call. I think that every all-in-one computer should make an effort at having a high quality webcam and microphone, because that's like half the reason people are buying this form factor, because they want all those little amenities built in. And the iMac continues to excel with that part of the experience. This redesigned iMac is now using an upgraded sound system. Apple created a six speaker setup to fit this chassis and you've got two pairs of subwoofers that give you that bass you need. And while I feel like the 24 inch model isn't quite as good as the 27 inch model speakers, they're still one of the best built in audio setups on any all in one you can buy. Typically with a thin chassis like this, you're not gonna get a rich and deep sound out of the speakers, but the iMac definitely defies that narrative. The main thing I appreciate about the iMac speakers is how well balanced they are. When listening to instrumental tracks, none of the instruments are jumbled together or are overpowering one another. The bass is really present and defined, but not overbearing, and the mids are really sharp and present as well. I think that the high end can be a little tinny when playing tracks that really push it, but like I said, these speakers are still pretty much outclassing all the competition. People typically want a small pair of speakers to complement a desktop setup like this, but I feel like the majority of casual users will be more than satisfied with what you get built into the iMac. It can get plenty loud, and it's overall just very enjoyable to listen to music on. Music 
And one of the highlight features you get with these new speakers is support for spatial audio when playing content with Dolby Atmos support. I tested this out with some Dolby Atmos compatible content and I could definitely hear and feel that separation, but it wasn't as dramatic as I expected. But I feel as though you shouldn't expect that crazy of an experience with Dolby Atmos content on a device like this. I think there's always room to tweak and refine that spatial audio experience on the iMac with software updates. Outside of all the major exterior changes, the biggest thing about this new iMac is what's inside, and that's the Apple M1 processor. This is the same processor that's found in the new 13-inch MacBook Air and Pro, as well as the new iPad Pros and the Mac Mini. And if you haven't seen any other content talking about this new processor, just know that this is a next-level performance upgrade coming from the 21.5-inch iMac. The CPU, GPU, memory, and storage are now combined on a single system on chip, and you're getting pretty much all the benefits you could ever want. Comparing this to the previous generation, you're going to feel an improvement in usability from head to toe. App optimization and performance for programs like Final Cut Pro, Logic, and all of Apple's other applications has been increased by tenfold with M1. No more long boot up times, no more beach balling, and most importantly, no more noise. Because of how power efficient these processors are, you're pretty much never gonna hear the machine make a sound, even when under extreme load. I've been using this iMac for several weeks now and I've yet to hear it make any sort of fan noise. From a performance standpoint, you simply don't have to worry about all the common struggles you might have dealt with on previous Intel-based iMacs. And it's overall just a night and day experience. For all of my people who are looking at this base model as a potential upgrade for photo and video editing, you may really want to think about it. For everyday basic tasks like web browsing and file management, you're going to always have a smooth experience with M1, but when pushing the computer with intensive tasks, you'll start to notice the machine acts a little squirrely. This variant of M1 has 8GB of RAM and a 7-core GPU as opposed to an 8-core GPU and 16 gigs of RAM that you would get on a higher spec model. And so this is really a base model MacBook Air on the inside, but for whatever reason, the iMac simply doesn't perform exactly the same for photo and video editing. When you Using programs like Final Cut Pro, the export times are pretty consistent across all of my M1 devices, but when it came down to just navigating the timeline and chopping stuff up, I often ran into weird little stutters that I rarely experienced on my M1 MacBook Air, which has the same guts on the inside. There are just a lot of weird one-off bugs that I encounter with this machine when trying to push it, and I think one half of that issue is definitely the RAM. 8GB of RAM just isn't enough for serious photo and video editing. Obviously any Mac will chop up iPhone footage with no problem, but once you start messing with 6K, 5K video, stuff like that, things definitely begin to change. So anyone who's looking to use an iMac for intensive tasks should either look at the 16 gigabyte model, the 24 inch, or the 2025K model. Either one of those will perform very well. When going on Twitter and expressing my grievances about the iMac's performance in comparison to the M1 MacBook Air, other reviewers told me that the reason for the lacking performance is because the iMac is powering a 4.5K display while the MacBook Air is not. But I'm not sure if I buy that because I never had the same issues when using my MacBook Air with my 4K and 5K ultrafine monitor. So I'm not sure what it is that makes the iMac lag a little in comparison, but generally speaking, this iMac is a solid performer for pretty much everything if you're not gonna go too crazy with it. And for those who don't care for video and photo editing or graphic designing or anything along those lines, the base model will do perfectly. I've recently installed the very first beta for macOS Monterey on this iMac, but it obviously isn't out in a final release yet, so most people won't be getting access to these new features until October or November of this year. But I just wanted to take a look at how some of these new software features could potentially make the iMac a more appealing device in general. For the iMac specifically, I think SharePlay functionality is going to be used by a lot of people. I've personally wanted functionality like this, being able to cast movies and music to my Mac like it's a smart TV. And for those who are going to be using Using this iMac as a kitchen counter or a living room computer, having this functionality is going to be super useful, and I'm glad Monterey's got it. You're going to be getting an updated version of Safari in macOS Monterey. Visually, Safari's got an all new look, and you've got new features for improving tab management and organization. For those of you who frequently use the focus feature on iPhone, you'll be able to use that on Mac as well, making it a lot easier to be uninterrupted and or properly notified when doing certain tasks. And probably the coolest feature, which unfortunately hasn't been activated in this beta, 
is universal control. This will allow you to control your Mac and iPad simultaneously with a single mouse and keyboard. And as well as being able to use the cursor on both devices at once, you'll be able to transfer files and documents from one device to the other using universal control, which is a pretty wicked feature. And I'm super anxious to test that feature out whenever they decide to release that beta update. And I know this is really only useful for people with a Mac and an iPad, but I think it's still worth mentioning. The 24 inch iMac is a really premium and well-made device all around. You've got a fantastic display and speakers, a great webcam and microphone, and more than enough performance for the average user with that M1 processor inside. If you can get past the design and color options and are looking for the best overall all-in-one experience, I think the iMac is a no-brainer. I think this is a machine that would be great for casual users and last them a very long time. And with all the future macOS features on the horizon, this computer will only get more capable with time. Some people may be wondering whether this iMac is a better value proposition than, let's say, a MacBook Air with a monitor or a Mac Mini with a monitor. And I think if portability is a deal breaker, definitely get the MacBook Air. And if you don't care about display and speaker quality all too much, the Mac Mini with a monitor is still a really solid option. But this iMac is geared towards users who are going to keep things simple, relatively speaking. They don't need optical audio and gigabit ethernet ports. They just need a nice computer to use every day. And while this is far from the cheapest option for a nice all-in-one, it's pretty much the best at the moment. But that's gonna do it for this one. I'm gonna continue using my Mac mini until either the new MacBook Pros or the larger iMac is released, but this is still a great computer regardless. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for future content like this. And let us know what you think about this new iMac. Are you gonna pick one up? Let us know in the comment section down below, and I'll talk to you guys in the next one. 9 to 5 Mac on YouTube is sponsored by Intego. Virus Barrier X9 will protect your M1 or Intel based Mac from malware like Silver Sparrow and Xcode Spy. Virus Barrier actively protects your Mac from malware and phishing attempts with real time scans and automatic updates. You don't have to be any sort of computer expert to start using this software either, as the setup and configuration process is designed to be easy for all users. 9 to 5 Mac readers can get up to two years of Intego Virus Barrier X9 protection for 50% off for a limited time when purchasing Intego's Mac Premium Bundle X9. This bundle includes all the great virus barrier features, plus more features for cleaning up your Mac and backing up your data. Be sure to click the first link in the description below if you're interested. And a big thanks to Intego for sponsoring 9to5Mac on YouTube.